Good evening, everybody. Thank you. I have 535, which is 530 Mount Sinai Standard Time. So I think we will begin. Um, thank you all for coming. My name is Sean Morrison, and I have the privilege to direct the Hertzberg Palliative Care Institute here at Mount Sinai. And also the really great privilege to welcome you to the Douglas West Annual Memorial Lecture in Palliative Care in honor of Hertzberg's founding director, Diane Meyer. To Susie and the rest of the West family, thank you. Um, for over 21 years now, you have helped to educate both the public and the profession about the benefits of palliative care and contributed in so many ways, not just through this lecture, to ensuring that everyone with serious illness and their families and caregivers has the added layer of support that palliative care provides. So on behalf, again, of all of us at Hertzberg, on behalf of our patients and our families, thank you and your family for endowing this lecture, and thank you very much for everything you have contributed to the Institute. And let me introduce you so you can say a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, Susan West. I didn't know Sean was going to introduce me, so I was introducing myself. So I think I'll start from that anyway. That's OK. It's short. It's very short. <laughs> Hi, I am Susie West, co-chair of the advisory board of the Hertzberg Palliative Care Institute, where I am a full-time volunteer. I want to welcome my family, sitting here, friends, and Mount Sinai community to the 21st Douglas West Lecture in Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine. We, we come together to remember my husband, Doug, and to honor Dr. Diane Meyer, who cared for him during the last 18 months of his life, a time when there was no formal palliative care. It seems so long ago, and sometimes it seems like yesterday. I rem uh, I'm a member of the Mount Sinai uh, Auxiliary Board with foresight and generosity. They gave Dr. Meyer seed money to build a palliative care program here. And eventually, Diane and Sean took it across the country and further on. This year, a major focus of our Brookdale Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine is training staff throughout the giant Mount Sinai health system to provide palliative care to patients and families with the greatest and most complex needs. As part of this effort, Dr. Elizabeth Lindenberger will be teaching primary palliative care to hospitalists. And Maureen Leahy, the nurse manager of the Wiener Palliative Care Unit, has designed three palliative care resource courses. Thus far, 200 nurses have attended to learn compassionate communication, symptom management, and resilience. In keeping with our role as the mothership of American palliative care, Dr. Sean Morrison traveled to Washington to testify in Congress about an act to enlist the federal government's help in support of fellowships, research, and expanded public awareness of palliative care. And I also went to Washington in December with Dr. Diane Meyer to be part of a workshop at the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Health on integrating the patient and caregiver's voice in medicine. I didn't prepare a formal speech. I just spoke about my experience with Doug and how even then, 20 year, 22 years ago, Diane was practicing what we now call palliative care, helping Doug and our family through that difficult time. My story of watching my husband's decline is similar in many ways to today's speaker's experience. And so I am very pleased to welcome Dr. Lucy Kalamithi as our Douglas West lecturer. Um, our next speaker will be Sasha Sidero, um, who is a co-chair with me at the Hertzberg Palliative Care Institute. Also, I would like to call out and a shout out about all the volunteers in, at Mount Sinai and in our audience today. Uh, National Volunteer Week is April 23rd to 29th. I think it should be every day. 
because we have over a thousand volunteers at Mount Sinai here alone, and without them, we wouldn't as function as well as we do. Thank you. So good afternoon. I also promise to be brief. Um, welcome to today's lecture. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Saskia Sidero. Susie mentioned I'm co-chair of the advisory board at the Hertzberg Palliative Care Institute. It's my honor today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lucy Kalanithi. Dr. Kalanithi is a faculty member at the Stanford University School of Medicine and the widow of Dr. Paul Kalanithi, the author of the New York Times bestseller, When Breath Becomes Air. Paul Kalanithi was a 36-year-old Stanford neurosurgery resident when he was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. A gifted writer with degrees in literature, philosophy, and medicine, Paul spent the last two years of his life sharing his reflections on some of the biggest, biggest questions we all face as mortal beings. What gives life meaning in the face of death? What do you do when your future, once on the distant horizon, is snatched by the present? And what does it mean to bring a new life into the world? Paul and Lucy have a daughter, Katie, just as one parent is preparing to leave it. Paul's last words of wisdom and of hope, together with a moving epilogue from Lucy, became When Breath Becomes Air, published about eight months after Paul's death. The book was an overnight success, spending 12 weeks at the top of the New York Times bestseller list. Lucy describes herself in the epilogue as Paul's wife and his witness. She's also an accomplished physician in her own right, a clinical assistant pr professor of medicine at the Stanford School of Medicine. She completed her medical degree at Yale, her residency at the University of California, San Francisco, and a postdoctoral fellowship in healthcare delivery innovation at Stanford's Clinical Excellence Research Center. At the cross-section of her experiences as a physician and as a caregiver, she's interested in healthcare value, patient-centered care, and end-of-life care. It's also my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's discussion. We just met him a moment ago, Dr. Sean Morrison. Dr. Morrison is the director of the Lillian and Benjamin Hertzberg Palliative Care Institute and the National Palliative Care Research Center, both of the Brookdale Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine at Mount Sinai. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Drs. Kalanithi and Morrison to the stage. So, um, thank you, Saskia. Last year, as a few of you may remember, I had the great pleasure of giving this lecture and then thinking I was done at least for the next decade. Um, and when I called Lucy and she so graciously um, agreed to come to New York and Mount Sinai to give this lecture, she said to me, oh, I really hate lecturing. It's so boring. Why don't we have a conversation? Um, so I am back up here, um, but please try to ignore me. Uh, before, um, before we begin, um, I suspect many of you, in fact, I would be surprised if there are people in this room who have not read Paul Kalanithi's book. But before we started, we wanted to actually just show a small video of Paul so you can meet him. Do we have that? He asked, hopefully. Five years down the line, I don't know what I'll be doing. I may be dead, I may not be. If you asked me when I was 17 what I'd be doing with my life, I would have said, oh, I'd definitely be a writer. But found medicine was, in fact, the perfect place. I first began noticing symptoms in my sixth year of residency. Obviously, Lucy and I were both very suspicious that I had some form of cancer. But actually having the confirmation is still devastating. Since Katie's birth, my time with her has had a very peculiar and free nature. 
in all probability, I won't live long enough for her to remember me. And so the time is just is what it is. It's a careful balance. If you don't think about the bad case, that ending is going to be very rough on you and your family. But if you don't think about the good case, you're going to miss an opportunity to really make the most out of your life and time. So, in the foreword um, to Paul's book, the noted, noted medical writer, um, Abram Vergesi, fellow faculty member of Lucy's at Stanford, describes Paul's prose as unforgettable, as if his pen was spinning gold and that the true brilliance of Paul's writing is most apparent when it's read, al read aloud. So I think what we'd like to do is start with um, hearing Paul's words from his wife, Lucy, if you could. <laughs> oh man, I was going to try to do the West Coast proud while here, but not enough to do a good start. I flipped through the CT scan images. The diagnosis obvious. The lungs were matted with innumerable tumors. The spine deformed. A full lobe of the liver obliterated. Cancer widely disseminated. I was a neurosurgical resident entering my final year of training. Over the last six years, I had examined scores of such scans on the off chance that some procedure might benefit the patient. But this scan was different. It was my own. I received the plastic arm bracelet all patients wear, put on the familiar light blue hospital gown, walked past the nurses I knew by name, and was checked into a room, the same room where I had seen hundreds of patients over the years. In this room, I had sat with patients and explained terminal diagnoses and complex operations. In this room, I had congratulated patients on being cured of a disease. In this room, I had pronounced patients dead. I had sat in the chairs, washed my hands in the sink, scrawled instructions on the marker board, changed the calendar. I had even, in moments of utter exhaustion, longed to lie down in this bed and sleep. Now I lay there wide awake. A young nurse, one I hadn't met, poked her head in. The doctor will be in soon. And with that, the future I had imagined, the one just about to be realized, the culmination of decades of striving, evaporated. This is like halfway through the book now. Flush in the face of mortality, many decisions became compressed, urgent, and unreceding. Foremost among them for us, should Lucy and I have a child? Even if our marriage had been strained toward the end of my residency, we had always remained very much in love. Our relationship was still deep in meaning, a shared and evolving vocabulary about what mattered. Both of us yearning to be parents, we each thought of the other. Lucy hoped I had years left. But understanding my prognosis, she felt that the choice whether to spend my remaining time as a father should be mine. What are you most afraid of or sad about, she asked me one night as we were lying in bed. Leaving you, I told her. Will having a newborn distract from the time we have together, she asked. Don't you think saying goodbye to your child will make your death more painful? Wouldn't it be great if it did, I said. Lucy and I both felt that life wasn't about avoiding suffering. Years ago, it had occurred to me that Darwin and Nietzsche agreed on one thing. The defining characteristic of the organism is striving. Describing life otherwise was like painting a tiger without stripes. We talked it over. Our families gave their blessing. We decided to have a child. We would carry on living instead of dying. 
think everyone in this room has probably read The Comes Air. And I think all of us in some way realize just what a remarkable um, person your husband was. And I think we get a little bit of that on the screen there. But I wonder if we could just start by you telling us a little bit about Paul and why he was so special to you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I first fell in love with Paul. I had, we were in the same class in medical school. We both went to Yale. Started in 2003. And I knew he was really smart. Um, but, <laughs> but I didn't sort of fall in love with him until I realized how funny he was. And most of our friends and family are a little bit heartbroken that when breath becomes air is not very funny. You can get like little tiny senses of it. But you know, this is the version of Paul that, um, this is Paul too. And um, I realized a few weeks into school when Paul was wearing his medical student ID on his um, you know, baby white coat that he was wearing a big mustache in the ID. And I was like, I don't remember seeing this guy in our class with a mustache. And it turned out he put on a fake mustache <laughs> for his student ID because he was really afraid that medical school was going to make him into something he wasn't. He'd been a sketch comedy writer and you know, a big explorer of... Um, kind of adventure and love literature and all these things. And you sort of like, now I'm entering medicine, which I really want to do. But what does that do to you as a person? And um, so the fake mustache was like this little amulet um, kind of thing. And meanwhile, then three years later, he's applying to be a neurosurgeon. And it's like on the face sheet of students. <laughs> so <laughs> like, Ooh. So, um, but, uh, but that turned out OK. So um, he just was a really. Um, uh, a live person. And you know that thing you said, wouldn't it be great if it did? It's just sort of like, wouldn't it be great if it did? So uh, he was really cool. And then he was, um, you know, a real lover of literature is the other piece of it. So um, thinking about sort of the human stories in medicine and um, the human experience was a really key part for him. So I want to start actually at the beginning of the book. And it was sort of notable to me that Paul starts to talk about all of these symptoms that he's having, yeah. um, weight loss, um, pain. Yeah. Um, and there's this, he keeps them to himself um, and completely, completely doesn't talk about them with you, um, doesn't say anything about it. Um, and actually, it gets to the point, and he writes about this, that things become so strained that you say, I need to move out for a week. Um, and I think what you say is, I don't, he quotes you as saying, I don't want to learn about your worries by accident. Mm -hmm. When I talk to you about being isolated, you don't seem to think it's a problem. Mm -hmm. I can't help but wonder, because you're a physician and because yeah. that you were watching this at the same time and wondering what was going on and not being able to, and I wondered yeah. what that was like. And yeah. I'm going to come one more to that. If you could, if I got to add to that, and then how you got past it, because it's very clear that yeah. you did. Yeah. Um, oh, man, that was so intense. And um, it's funny because Paul puts that in the prologue to the book where he leads up to that moment of diagnosis. And then for the first half of the book, he retreats and talks about um, his life before the diagnosis, including as a neurosurgeon. But that time was so challenging. I mean, it's, it was very hard because, um, you know, the bulk of it was that he was working as a chief resident in neurosurgery, and you're lucky if you work you know, 80 hours a week. Um, and he started to have really pretty classic symptoms of um, some kind of serious illness, weight loss and night sweats, and at the same time was trying to get a faculty job and then um, got this chest X-ray with his primary care doctor that showed nodules um, in the X-ray and got admitted to the hospital for expedited workup. And it was sort of like, oh, you see, you put the symptoms together with the x-ray, and it's like, you know, if you hope you have disseminated tuberculosis, you know you're having a bad day. You know, like, this is really serious. And when we packed for the hospital, um, he brought a series of books with him, actually. It was kind of interesting. Um, he brought C.S. Lewis and um, the Solzhenitsyn novel called Cancer Ward and uh, Heidegger. And they were just sort of in this little pile on his... Um, the bedside table of his hospital bed. But that was interesting to sort of see him turn back to literature and like make sense of what was happening. But um, yeah, I mean, I remember thinking at the time, 
you know, realizing what was about to happen and realizing he was about to get this diagnosis and it's like the future really did evaporate. It's like so much of you is tied up in your future version of yourself, you know, whether it's having children or training in healthcare, it's like your future self reflects back onto you and who you feel like you are. And um, that literally felt like it just shattered. Um, and somehow, so one of the first things Paul said to me um, when the diagnosis was really clear and we looked at the CT scan together, he said, I, I want you to remarry after I die. And it was literally one of the first things he said. And um, that was pretty emblematic of a particular thing that I think ended up making it work um, and really drawing us together, which was in that sentence of I want you to remarry is an admission of what's likely to happen and an admission that you're willing to talk about it and an admission that you really have the other person's best interests in your mind too. It's, it was really sort of selfless, beautiful thing to say. So I think um, in a way he sort of set the tone in that one sentence of like, it's it, we're going to talk about this and we're going to get through this together. And I don't know, that was part of it. And then I think, um, you know, being doctors, it was sort of the best and worst part too. We sort of didn't have any illusions of what was likely to be the clinical course. Um, Although cancer science is super exciting right now, as I'm sure many people in this room know or are working on. And um, uh, I think the fact that we sort of knew the ins and outs of the healthcare system was incredibly empowering, where I think about all the patients who don't and don't have, you know, family or material support or um, health literacy or whatever. I sort of felt like, oh, like, I know how to do this. I can, I feel like I can do this. And... Um, I also think we just got lucky. I think some people, Paul talks about talking about talking with patients about this, but I think some people you can sort of get further apart when this kind of thing happens, and other people draw together, and it's like, how do you how do you do the second one? So, I, some of it I think we just got lucky, and some of it I think even through that strife, we were really in love, and so this just sort of stripped that away, you know. Can I push it a little further because you said some people grow farther apart. Mm -hmm. Some people grow closer together, and as you're right, I think love is part of it, but you know, I certainly see a lot of people in love um, who are going through this that they don't seem to develop the ability to talk to each other the way you did mm -hmm. and to talk about your emotions, to talk about what's next that he writes about, the way that you two manage to do, particularly given where it seems Paul started from. Mm -hmm. I wondered if there were some real, what, what got you from one point um, yeah, good question. I mean, I think, interestingly, once Paul was writing the manuscript, it was a communication tool for us. So that was kind of interesting to see. Like, some of what's in the book is more intimate than what he said out loud, um, which is sort of fascinating, right? Like, oh, maybe, the, maybe writing is even a way to communicate with each other if you, you know, it adds something. Um, there's this woman, um, Bonnie Adario, who runs a lung cancer foundation. It's like a patient-run foundation near us in California. And she often has people ask her, you know, my family's not talking about what's going on, and we're all, like, holding it inside. And she says, here's my suggestion. Just go sit at your kitchen table, and everybody sit around the table, and then go around and everybody say what they're the most scared of. Which sounds so simple and also kind of scary, but it's like, I do feel like everybody's thinking about their fears all the time. And even if you're in like full on battle metaphor mode, you also are like secretly thinking about, well, what if the worst happens? And like, am I dying? And how do I know? And who can I talk to? Um, so I think the idea that you can go through that sort of connected with each other rather than, not, I think a lot of times people feel like they're protecting each other, but um, sometimes you can feel more isolated. So. I think we had an instinct about that. Um, yeah, I don't know. So let's switch gears a little bit because I'm conscious of a lot of medical professionals in the audience. Paul spends a lot of time talking about prognosis. Mm -hmm. And he writes about it. I just, uh, he writes about um, a wonderful relationship with his oncologist who he calls Emma. Yeah, throughout that relationship, 
he can never get her. Mm -hmm. And I sounds like he presses pretty hard um, to talk about prognosis and what he has left to the point that she won't even talk big picture for him. Um, and it seems to me that um, Paul struggled a lot with uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And this, from my perspective, can only have made that perhaps worse. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you both yeah. coped with that and whether, I guess hindsight is always twenty twenty. but whether that was the right thing for both of you to sort of leave that so vague. Right. Um, uh, so there were two points, interestingly, that are not mentioned in the book in which Paul's oncologist did prognosticate very explicitly. One was with Paul's parents. So uh, for people who haven't read the book, basically, as soon as he gets diagnosed and then meets the oncologist, he says, okay, so I'm going to want to look at the Kaplan-Meier curves with you and talk about prognosis and estimating prognosis. And she says, absolutely not. We'll talk about everything else. We're not going to talk about that. She was really pretty shocking. And I remember being like sort of affronted. I was like, are you serious? Like he's asking you and he's a doctor and you know, we can look at this stuff ourselves or whatever. And so obviously we did. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, um, but there were two times she did. One was with Paul's parents all the way through his illness because they were so hopeful that he could be cured and there just isn't a cure um, as it stands now, you know. Um, and there's some really interesting statistic where it's like two-thirds of patients with metastatic cancer don't quite get that the, the treatment doesn't have curative intent, which is, I mean, like, that's crazy, right? Like, where's the information breaking down? And if you and your wife are deciding to have a baby, like, is that information helpful or not? And... Um, so for our family, the thing that, so anyway, she prognosticated then with Paul's parents, or she at least said, like, this, is, this cannot be cured. And then when Paul was very sick toward the end of his life and had new brain mets and leptomeningeal disease um, and a very short prognosis, um, she said that explicitly. She was like, I think your prognosis is now on the order of days to weeks. Um, which was actually like, wow, she's really putting a stake in the sand. And even just the fact of her doing that feels... Um, uh, I don't even know the word, like, it, it like underscores the words, you know. And um, meanwhile, she's totally spectacular. And I think the thing that, things that were most helpful in our family were um, Paul and I did seek um, to understand the likely range of, you know, prognosis. And I think there are some um, physicians who are doing, or clinicians who are doing this thing where if you're talking about prognosis, you can say, well, why don't we think about, like, the best case, the worst case, and then the most likely case, which was kind of helpful. I think Paul and I both sort of instinctively thought about it that way, um, you know, which was we're not just like, it's going to be 18 months. We're like, it's probably going to be months to a couple of years. Maybe it's going to be shorter. And I think both of us actually thought that initially. Maybe it's going to be multiple years or a decade, maybe, um, based on, you know, current and emerging therapies. And in Paul's mind, he had the thought, you know, maybe I'm just going to live a couple years, but if I were one of those, like, slightly longer-term survivors and I didn't go back to finish my neurosurgery residency, I would kick myself. So he sort of had this idea of, while I'm on the first-line therapy, a targeted therapy, one pill a day chemo, super easy to take, feeling better, I'm going to go back to residency. Um, and interestingly, I had much less, like, resentment around that. When he was, like, working hard and sick, I was like, you know, I, it was sort of like this more unconditional love in a way, because I think you don't really have unconditional love for a grown-up, you know? You, there's conditions, right? Um, <laughs> many. There's <laughs> many, I know. Um, but I, think, I just felt so compelled to sort of say, you know, this is your, like, what can I do to help you live this time. And um, and then it's super romantic, right? Because most of it is he's like, I want to spend this time with you, which is super romantic. It's like it's not a long marriage. It's a short marriage. And, but when you have that period of time, it's like, and be together, it's romantic. Um, uh, so anyway, he went back to residency. And then when the first line treatment stopped working and the treatment became more arduous and less likely to work as well, then he stopped working as a neurosurgeon, which is sort of its own 
painful moment. It's almost like being re-diagnosed. You know, when things progress, um, you sort of you sort of start to become a more specified type of patient. At the beginning, like the whole range of possibility is open, and then as your condition changes, it's like, oh yeah, I probably am in the group of a couple years, and you adjust to that. You know. Um, so he was always sort of working to the best case scenario, but also keeping in mind the likely and like planning for the worst and sort of talking about the worst. So, but then the like fact of holding all of those in your mind at the same time and being uncertain is like uncertainty I realized is its own version of pain. You know, even if things are going well, you're sort of carrying around this question mark all the time. So, um, but that was how we thought about it. And it was, and we had a sense of it. And when we had Katie, our daughter who's now two and a half, um, we did not do it in order to spite cancer. We knew what was happening, which was sort of like raised a lot of eyebrows, I think, and my, including mine. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, I think that's how we thought about it. So I'm going to stay sort of just for a moment on the, the medical piece, because Paul also writes about how his diagnosis changed him as a physician. Yeah. And he writes a lot about that. But I was wondering, did it change you during this time? And has it changed your practice and how you e yeah. talk with patients about cancer or work with people with another serious illness? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, one is I have a much deeper sense of what it means to be a caregiver. Um, like a family caregiver, usually it's um, a spouse or an adult child, right? It's um, so when I walk into a patient room and there's a caregiver sitting there, I and Paul's oncologist did this too. I often talk in the um, you know like second person plural. Paul's oncologist used to say things like, "How's the new pain medication working out for you guys?" And it wasn't like, "How's it working out for Paul?" It's like, "How's it working out for you guys?" And that is what it felt like um, in real life. So. I, I sort of feel this connection to the caregiver role um, and it's this understanding of like, oh, that might actually be the person who's implementing the plan. And um, I also have something that's a little different for me, and Paul um, felt this too. Uh, when he returned to work and he himself was sick, he's, he said he felt more compelled to describe for patients what he sort of expected the experiential piece of the illness or treatment to be. And, you know, especially if you're reading someone um, or going through the informed consent for a surgery, you're sort of like bleeding, infection, death, like you hit the big high points. But for him, it was like, it became much more about, again, like the most likely scenario. Like what's it really gonna feel like? And how long is it actually gonna take you to get back to work? And, you know, I, I feel like he was sort of, um, he, got a, he got a little bit more connected to what it feels like to be a patient. And then I also now, when I see patients, I realize how much you hang on the clinician's every word and how highly anticipated the appointment is. It's like 30 minutes of their life, or if you're lucky, right? But it's also like your patients have this like big imagined relationship with you that like you don't even know about. It's just like, I feel like Paul just was in love with his oncologist in this really beautiful way and so emotionally dependent on her in a way that I wouldn't have expected for like a young, large and in charge neurosurgeon. You know, it's, um, there was this real vulnerability and a real sense of like needing her, not just for the clinical um, uh, skill. So I sort of feel this deeper emotional um, well. I mean, I had a lot of that before but I just feel there's like this real love backing it up now, you know? Yeah. yeah. There's this wonderful, or perhaps wonderful is the wrong word, very moving part of the book where Paul's in remission mm -hmm. and he's looking at a job in Wisconsin. And I will spare everybody the flyaway state jokes. Um, <laughs> and he's getting driven back to his hotel by the chairman. Um, so clearly he was a high recruit. Um, and they're driving past this frozen lake and the chair of the department says to him, you know, in the summer you can swim, you can sail, this is right on your way home from work. Um, and Paul writes at that time, it was like a fantasy. 
we could never move to Wisconsin. What if I had a serious relapse in two years? Lucy would be isolated, stripped of her friends and family, alone. As furiously as I had tried to resist, I realized that cancer had changed the calculus. For the last several months, I had striven, striven with every ounce to restore my life to its pre-cancer trajectory, trying to deny cancer any purchase on my life. The curse of cancer created a strange and strained existence, challenging me to be neither blind to nor bound by death's approach. Challenging me to be neither blind to nor bound by death's approach. How did you guys live there in that sort of in-between mm -hmm. land for so long? Oh, man. Um, it was so intense. I think there really was the uncertainty and then the joy and pain all being there together. It was just, you just had to tolerate it and bear it. Um, uh, and you, did you read the line where he says, I felt the claws of the crab holding me back? Yes. Like the claws of the crab. I kept like that one answer. out, but yes, yeah. Uh, I didn't even like get the claws of the crab until after Paul died. There's all these things in the book where I'm like, oh, claws of the crab, good for you. Like it's like, <laughs> um, uh, I don't even know how to answer this question, how we did it. It was so painful, but um, I don't know. For me personally, it was like, there was real nuts and bolts that really mattered. Like the big ones for me were sleep, exercise, and mindfulness meditation. You know, like the mindfulness meditation, you sort of learn how to accept things non-judgmentally. So I can say like, it was so painful, but I'm not saying like, it was a horrendous nightmare. You know, it's like, it's a different way of relating to um, pain. Um, and I have this really great therapist who um, says, says pain plus non-acceptance of pain equals suffering. And it's sort of this, like, you know, Buddhist ideas echo back from that. But uh, when she first said it, I was like, but I don't get it. Like, this must not be like this. And she was, and now I sort of get it, you know. And I don't know how Paul got to that place, actually. I don't quite understand. Uh, but that was helpful. Um, you know, and I also think, like, if people say things like, oh, what happened to Paul was so unfair, you know, like the idea of unfairness similarly is just like kind of orthogonal to illness. It's just like stuff happens, you know, and I think, I don't know, meanwhile, it, I don't know. Also, I mean, it, it's, I'm not trying to make it sound easy either. Like, I'll just say this. After, after Paul died was the worst part for me, which maybe seems obvious, but is true. And um, he sort of had this real upheaval in his identity when he was diagnosed. And I felt like I had the similar thing, but after he died. And for a year, I had very severe tingling in my hands, like tingling and burning. And I had had carpal tunnel kind of as a um, new attending, like on the computer, I don't know what. And I was convinced that I now had this really severe recurrence of carpal tunnel and that I was going to obviously become disabled and not be able to take care of Katie. And I had these incredible catastrophic thoughts related to, like, essentially really severe anxiety. It's hard to tease out, like, depression, anxiety, and grief. I don't know what's what. Um, uh, but after about a year, it lifted. And it was, I really think it was conversion disorder, actually. Like, this fact of having psychological stress play out as physical symptoms in your body. And obviously, insomnia is like a super common version of stress affecting your body. But this was like, I don't know. Um, it was so wild to see the actual effects of grief, you know. Um, and meanwhile, I thought I was doing well. I was like working on the book. I went back to work, all these things. But it was like my hands were falling off. So I think um, <laughs> it just is so not easy. Yeah. You, you know? took an unfinished manuscript mm -hmm. right after Paul died mm -hmm. and shepherded all the way through to publication, including writing um, a pretty remarkable epilogue. As you went through that process, were there things in the book that surprised you that you didn't know? Um, mm -hmm. Were there things that you said, geez, that's not right? Or mm -hmm. I wasn't quite how I remembered it. And what was that like for you during this whole time? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so Paul died with the manuscript mostly complete and the title and the epigraph and the sections and everything, but 
there were some notes that he had made, things like insert anatomy lab essay. Um, <laughs> and so the whole bit about the, for people who've read it, there's a piece about the anatomy lab and how when you're a student and you take a CPR class, you're pretending that the mannequins are real. And then you enter the anatomy lab and you're pretending that the cadavers are fake. And like, what's the, what does it mean to become a physician and to relate to human bodies in this way that they're sort of mechanism? And, um, but that, he wrote that as a second year med student as like a reflection. And, and so when we were working on just ensuring that the manuscript was complete and substantial enough to be a book, I was like, I know where that is. I can go get that, get that. Um, and there's other sort of pieces of Paul's writing um, from his master's thesis, from a couple of emails to this best friend um, with whom he sort of had this epistolary relationship. There, so there's stuff that fleshes out um, the manuscript a little bit more. And we had to be really thoughtful about that. And it's all Paul's words, and it's all of a piece with his thinking about you know mortality and meaning. But uh, the book is shaped a little bit. It's a little bit... Um, like longer than it was when Paul left it, and that was sort of by necessity. Um, there wasn't exactly anything that surprised me. Um, he had a list of a couple other things he was going to write about, and one of them was our wedding. And I was sort of like, oh, I wish that I had, could read that. Um, I'd love to read that. And um, then Random House asked me, um, you know, the bit about deciding to have a baby or a bit about your marriage, like, is there anything you wanted to redact? Um, and I was like, no, I mean, first of all, out of obligation to Paul, you know, this is Paul's story, this is what he wrote down, this was what he wanted. And then I was like, well, if I were the reader, those are some of the pieces I would like, you know, when the people get quite raw and um, when you sort of realize that he's going um, he's gonna to be very frank. So, um, and then it's like, there were all these other things to do, like, um, choose the cover. So the cover wasn't there when Paul was alive. He had just secured the book deal um, a few months before he died. And so, um, and on the book cover, it's like they tend to work pretty hard until you love it. And he, you know, the editor was like, we will not stop until you love it. And I was like, okay, I'm not anxious anymore because I'm going to love it. And so, um, and I had said, like, I, it needs to be like masculine and timeless and classic and not too trendy but stylish. And, it, you know, like it was a pretty, narrow target and um, and when they first did it the, these um, words were all lowercase and it looked a little bit too like of the moment it was like I can't quite say but can you send it back and then they sent it back with like these capital this lowercase I was like oh that looks better and so um, the, you know but especially during a time of grief to have a legacy project and then to have the ability to um, talk about it and like interact around your feelings and um, what's actually happening was very helpful. I think I took a little time off work to do this and returning to work, I had to like drag my legs in every day. I think a lot of people feel that even about maternity leave, you know, it's like your life is so different and how do you integrate everything? And so the fact of the book was super helpful for me too. So I know that I suspect some people might want to ask questions, and we have time for that. But just before we do, one more reading? Can we yeah, ask? Yeah, sure. sure. Um, so I'm going to read a bit of an essay that I wrote um, that was in the New York Times, and it's called uh, My Marriage Didn't End When I Became a Widow. And it's talking about the ways in which your relationship sort of continues after somebody dies. <clears throat> one night recently, alone in bed, I read A Grief Observed by C.S. Lewis, and I came across the observation that, quote, bereavement is not the truncation of married love, but one of its regular phases. He writes that what we want is to live our marriage well and faithfully through that phase too. Yes, I breathed, bereavement is more than learning to separate from a spouse. Before he died, Paul asked me to shepherd the manuscript of his book to publication. Doing so over the past past month, I have felt I'm continuing to help Paul live out his life and give this gift to our daughter. And now, as I watch Paul's work take on a life of its own, I begin to take on a, <clears throat> I begin to take on a life of my own. Our home is now a home for our daughter and me. I've kept Paul's favorite clothes and books, but he no longer has a sock drawer or his own bookcase. I bought a new bed. I've gone back to work. 
Six months after Paul died, I removed my wedding ring because it felt right to do so in that moment. Only minutes before, I had not yet considered it. I've learned that the timing of bereavement, perhaps like the initial stages of falling in love, is utterly unpredictable. As a child, I was always told that a grave should be stepped around, not onto, that only flowers should touch it. With Paul, the rules feel reversed. Just as it felt right to lie alongside the grave, finally restful on that spring afternoon a few weeks after his death, it feels right to bring some friends there now, to watch the sunset and pour a beer out for him. And it feels right for our bright-eyed one-year-old daughter to crawl among the flowers I've placed on the grave. We are making this place ours and his. So we have time for some questions or thoughts, and there are microphones set up in um, both aisles. And if people want to ask Lucy a question um, or raise a reflection, um, please go to the mics, um, because um, otherwise nobody can hear you. I was wondering how you managed with a newborn child during all of this. Yeah, how did we manage with a newborn during this? So. Um, uh, it was pretty gnarly at times. The Paul, um, Katie was eight months old when Paul died. Uh, but right before she was born, Paul was actually hospitalized for a period of about two and a half weeks, um, including some time in the intensive care unit. And I was 38 weeks pregnant and ended up sleeping in one of his old neurosurgery call rooms with my mom, actually. Um, so that was an Answer, that's part of the answer to that question is like really significant family support, including once she was a newborn. And, um, and there was this really great moment during that time where I was pregnant and Paul was really sick and the nurses spent a ton of time, like the ICU nurses talking to the L&D nurses, trying to figure out like if this baby's born and he's still an inpatient, how do we, we can't bring the baby to the ICU, but can we bring him to L&D or maybe vice versa? <coughs> <laughs> and it, I mean, it was, like, very intense, but also it just was what was happening. And people were on board to try to sort some of that stuff out. Um, and then I was very worried about postpartum depression because my sister has had really severe postpartum depression two times with both of her children and wrote about it. Actually, she's a writer and a blogger and wrote about it. Um, so she talked to me a lot about that and then, you know, it's like, and if I was sort of like, if I become depressed and that takes up four months of time and Paul lives for X amount of time, then it's like, we're literally talking about months, like the months matter. And obviously depression is like incredibly isolating anyway and painful. Um, but I was very uh, aware of like the coping strategies that I was really trying to do. And obviously sleep is a tough one, but Paul's mom and my mom were really helping. And uh, it was just sort of this big um, like team effort during that time. Um, yeah, I, again, if people have questions, or please go to the mics, but I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, did religion help, or was religion a part of your experience? The uh, question was, did religion help? Yeah, so um, the role of religion. And in that video, you can see that that, um, that was Katie's baptism, was like one of the series in that video. Um, so Paul definitely would have said he was a, he was a, Christian. He was a practicing Christian, identified as a Christian, and um, I kind of think he was more like a Christian humanist, which is sort of a contradiction, but I think like describes <laughs> what, what he was. And, uh, and for him, similarly to like the marriage thing, I don't think that his faith got weaker or stronger during the time of his illness, and I think that can happen for a lot of people. Um, uh, and did for me, I mean, I, I would say I'm agnostic, I guess, but I used to be atheist, so like that feels like a big joke. <laughs> um, uh, I think when someone dies, I'm just like, how could I not be agnostic? I'm like, I don't know. Um, and, uh, and I think for Paul, um, like the fact of his religious faith, which had been sort of rocky throughout his life, I mean, he writes about that in the book, um, and I think it's, you know, it's funny because like, you know, atheists and neuroscientists come up to me and say like, this is our guy, this guy gets me. And then, you know, um, really faithful Christians come up to me and say, this is our guy, this guy gets me. And I think it's because he's talking just about a journey, right? He's talking about a struggle. It sort of doesn't matter where you end up. It's just like we're all struggling with whatever. It doesn't even have to be religion. And um, 
But I think for him, the, the fact of religion even was more, like less about even like what happens after you die and just more about what your purpose is in your life and what it means to live a good life. And so I almost think like it helped him um, through the process of living with the illness and dying, um, not because it promised something else, but because it sort of under, under, excuse me, underscored um, for him, like the sort of depth of his life. So um, yes, it's the answer. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, sharing your story. You mentioned this idea that unfairness is kind of mm-hmm. orthogonal to illness and, and maybe besides the point. Can you talk about things that family and friends said to you that were Mm -hmm. perhaps especially helpful or or maybe less so? Yeah, sure. Um, So I'm in this closed Facebook group called Hot Young Widows Club. And it's it's really great. It was started by Nora McInerney, who has that podcast um, called Terrible Thanks for Asking, which is really great about people facing hardship. so anyway, she's a young widow with a kid and all these various things and um, started this group, Hot Young Widows Club. And so people talk about that, like, oh, somebody said this thing. It's like the worst thing to say. And um, the only thing that everybody consistently agrees on is don't say everything happens for a reason to, some, <laughs> to somebody who's in pain. Um, that I think, like, there's pretty unanimous agreement on that. Even, but then at the same time, it's like, if you say that, you're, you're just trying to, you're trying to say a thing, right, that indicates that you really care um, and that you wish you could help. So I just sort of didn't take offense. At, I can't even remember. Like, I just felt like people were trying so hard, and I was so connected to that. Um, a thing that was really helpful for Paul was um, when people would just sort of show up um, and not necessarily treat him with kid gloves. But, for example, he loved it when people asked him for advice when he was sick because he was sort of like, you know, I'm still me. I'm still an agent. I still care about what's going on in other people's lives. Um, and I think, like, when people sort of treat you with kid gloves, that can be isolating. So um, that was one thing that was helpful, I think, too. So I think we need to close um, But I want to really thank Lucy Kalanithi for just an incredible hour with us and also for everything that you've done over the past two years. I can't imagine um, what your life has been like and certainly um, the amount of speaking and travel you've done to really educate the public is incredible. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.